of of like I guess content, if you will, this week and then week fifteen. So week sixteen is meant to is like a reflection week. So it's not like reading anything I'm going through. So we kind of want to use uh, the last this week sixteen, which is that Wednesday before spring break. It's really kind of just be like a celebration day. I think that we can just kind of all turn it kind of into something. We can still definitely share. Um, maybe overall, what are some things that kind of stuck out to us throughout the time in the Bible study, but um, just really a celebration of completing the Bible study. You know, we've been together for, for some weeks now, so I think it's something to, to not just do like a, a hard stop and then like, oh, we're done. You know, we've read the last verse, but I think it'd be cool for us to still get together that last week. So um, this is week 14, week 15. We will finish out the gospel of Mark um, through chapter 16. And then week 16, which will be that second week in March, I think next week is March 1st. So I think March 8th is the next Wednesday will be like a celebration day for all of us. Um, so just kind of want to share that with you all. That's kind of like what's what's to come after today. Um, be sad to, uh, to to not be doing this on Wednesdays, but I know we do have a, a parenting class now, which we let people know. It's not just for parents. It's really for anybody that has any type of influence over students or youth or children. Um, so mentors, coaches, teachers, whatever that is, um, it's just the class, the book says it's a parenting book, but like I said, if you're over kids, you're going to deal with the same situation. So, um, so we're going to start that actually on actually this Sunday, um, we'll be meeting here at our house from at, uh, at three 30. Um, it's been like an, you know, it's kind of the same time frame, like an hour, hour, 15 minutes. Um, there's a video actually with this one. It's, it's just six sessions. So it's not going to be this long, you know, we're not going to be here for 16 weeks or something like that. Um, it's going to go through the end of April, but we have some weeks that we are like not going to meet for that because we'll have our, our Easter service that we're doing um, on, on April 9th, um, spring break week. We're going to kind of like take those two, two Sundays off. Just, I know people will be traveling and stuff. So, um, so we're excited about that though. We've gone through before, it's called Christ Center Parenting um, by Russell Moore, but the videos have uh, Jen Wilkin from um, the Village Church in Flower Mound, Jackie Hill Perry's in there. Um, there's another guy from Passion in DC. I can't think of his name right now, but um, it's just a few different people like panelists. And so the videos are like 25 minutes or so. And so we'll be able to kind of like talk about some things. What do we want to kind of get out of today's lesson? watch the videos and then we can kind of all talk about what that is after it. And each each week has a specific topic. And so that topic might be technology, it might be gender identity, it might be dating or relationships. Um, but within the book, and we have some, some books, um, within the book, it breaks down how to talk about that topic with a specific age group. So if you're if you're dealing with somebody that's eight years old, how do you talk about technology? What are they asking at eight versus a 16 year old? or even somebody that's in college. It goes all the way up to people that are in undergraduate college. So I think it's very good because it's more of a timeless book. It's not a, you read it from cover to cover. You say, hey, this is how this is how old the person is that I'm influencing. This is the section that I should be reading at this time. Um, one thing I will say is I don't encourage you to put your age at those times throughout the book because I did that for myself. And I was like, man, I'm going to be, uh, how old am I going to be with my kids this age? So I would say not that. Um, but essentially on each section here, so I'll give you like an example. This one says a Christ-centered identity. So it has like a little article in there that you would just kind of read and take some notes. <clears throat> Um, a man, a man and woman, God's plan. So kind of another thing. So this is all related to gender um, loss of identity. So this talks about mental health, depression and suicide. And so each one is like two or three pages. And then when you get to the end of it, it has this big idea section. And in there it says key scriptures that relate to this um, key questions that you're uh, that the person might be asking. So this section says preschoolers. So like for a preschooler, they might ask, who am I or what is the big world around me? Um, at this age, they will be labeling themselves as a boy or a girl or having a sense of gender identity in some capacity. But then if you go to this one says of a middle school, it has the same format, but it says these are the questions that a middle schooler would ask about identity. Or here are what most, um, it says middle schoolers will feel pressure to acquire peer approval and, and affirmation. So basically your preschooler might not be dealing with peer pressure and affirmation like a middle schooler would, but it's all still related to gender identity. 
And so this is going to be uh, six sessions. So we'll be doing it for, for basically six weeks um, at that time. So um, so we have some books. Feel free if you guys are here, if you want to check them out. But we'll be doing that here on Sundays at 3.30. Um, we'll be definitely anybody that you know, wants to do it. We'll send you out all the information just about that if you want to come. Um, we're excited about that. Um, but here we are. So Bible study, um, ready to get ready to get into it here. So week 14, um, we are in, we're still in the gospel of Mark, um, uh, really getting, getting into, uh, week 13, we really talked about Jesus was honing in on, um, he, he was honing in on like what's to come basically. Like we're in this present age, him and his disciples, here are the things that you are going to deal with. Um, and then what is going to happen in the coming age and the kingdom to come. And so he he really focused a lot on that through chapter 13. And in the first part of 14 is where Jesus was anointed um, by Mary. And then it talked about how Judas was mad that, you know, why would she waste all that money? That's almost a year's salary that she just poured on his head. Like, why would she do all of that? And so now he's upset. And so he's deciding to plot against Jesus to betray him. And that's where it leads us today. So I'm going to go ahead and pray us in, and then we'll get right into here into week 14. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, allowing us just to get to this point um, in this Bible study. Um, you have uh, inspired your word um, to be written for uh, for our edification, for our, for our growth. And we're thankful that we get to, um, to read word for word and line for line um, what it is that you want us to know and to re reveal yourself to us. And so as we continue on in, um, in finishing out the gospel of Mark, um, we just pray that we can continue to get um, a, a revelation of you, of what it is that you want us to know about you as we continue to live in this world, even though we are hoping and seeking towards the kingdom that is to come. So thank you for your son, Jesus, for the model that he has set for us, um, especially as we've been reading throughout his, his ministry, seeing his, his power, his principles, and now as we're in his passion. And so as we are getting into the, uh, the crucifixion stage now, um, we're, we're in the betrayal. Um, we just pray that we can truly just to glean um, uh, great wisdom from you in this time, as well as from others as we continue to discuss and, uh, and, and just, uh, just dialogue about what it is that, that we should know about you and, and how we should be um, in the world as believers. So thank you for this time. We just pray that it's a great fellowship together and study time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so day one, um, we're in Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to 31. Um, I know this week, um, it, you can see it had a lot more reading, I feel like, than the other weeks if you were able to go through. I think even chapter 14 has like 70 verses or something like that. Like it was a, it was a pretty extensive one. Um, so there's probably going to be times today where I'm probably not going to read through all of the text in there. Um, but we'll at least be able to, we'll still be talking about it and kind of what's going on. Um, but here on day one, it does say, and on the first day of unleavened bread, and when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and pre uh, prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city, excuse me, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready there prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Um, so we know up until this point, it's basically springtime. It's leading into this, um, what we know is Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, but it's leading, it's, it's Passover time. Um, and that's just in, in O2 in Exodus when, um, you know, they would have to put the blood on the posts of their doors and uh, the spirit will God will pass over you. So you will be saved and anyone that doesn't do it, they will, they will be killed. And so they're just commemorating this event with the Passover lamb. Um, but this is very significant because it is, a, they're celebrating the Passover um, and there's a sacrifice of a lamb. But of course, Jesus, as we know as believers, is the Passover lamb, the, the ultimate Passover lamb, um, the ultimate sacrifice for all. So it's significant because now he's setting the tone for this where we're going through an action, um, but little do they know it's something even bigger than just what they're going to partake in right now. And so um, one of the questions that it says is going to, he told them to go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you there. Um, I just want to ask, is there anything significant about that, that maybe you guys, uh, it, it, I don't know if you kind of read something into that, but just for it to say a man carrying a jar of water just kind of seemed pretty random at first glance, but did you guys kind of get something from that if there's any significance with it? Exactly. So here they are celebrating Passover. And so Jesus has kind of got this covert op mission going on. 
He's like, hey, look for the man that's carrying the water because that's not normally what's going to happen. So now they have a clue on where to go. And ultimately they go into a place where the upper room, which is the same upper room that we see in, in Acts 1, when they are um, adding in somebody to fill for Judas, who's no longer one of the disciples. Um, but he's just saying, hey, here's going to be a place, place for us. Um, he says, he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. Um, I, I, I'm, when I read this, I thought it was pretty interesting because is this one of those situations where was the room was the room just ready and you're just following this guy? I know sometimes people might use the word coincidence or how do we see this as more of like, is this a, a miracle or a power of God, an act of God in the sense like, hey, I've, I'm sovereign. I've orchestrated all these different things where this guy, because even when he says um, he tells them to tell uh, the per the master. The teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room. So like, did Jesus go here beforehand and say something to him? Or is this just kind of like this, this divine providence that's happening and he's heard about Jesus, he knows what's going on. But all in all, there's just this, this covert operation that they have to do. They're celebrating openly. It's almost like they are hiding in plain sight because everybody's celebrating Passover, but they're kind of, they're a special group. It's him with the disciples, about to get into the Lord's Supper, like this is a very, very important moment here. And so then in 17, it says, um, and when it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is the one, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me for the son of man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man to not have been born. Um, I want to just read this next section and then kind of take a pause because it says, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, um, blessing it, broke it, gave it to them and said, take this as my body. And so before we go, something that really stuck out to me in this in this passage is. So here he's saying somebody's going to betray me. Somebody's going to cross me. They're going to you know turn me over whatever it is, one of you, and they're all like, okay, which one is it? And he was like the one that dips the bread. Well, they're all doing these things. And even in the next, in 22, and it says, and as they were eating, for me, I'm just thinking like, so he says the person that is going to, that's dipping the bread along with me and basically eating with me is the one that betrays me. So after this profound statement to say who's eating with me, yet they keep on eating. They're asking, is it I? Am I the one that's going to do it? To me, I'm just like, maybe I should just stop eating right now. I'm not, I'm not hungry anymore. It's kind of the way that I looked at it. Like, let me know that it's not going to be me. Um, but they're just kind of like, eh, okay, somebody's going to betray them. But I'm hungry, so we're just going to just keep celebrating right now. It's, it's Passover, so we're just going to keep the party going. So I thought that I was just kind of very interesting with that. Um, um, and, and, and it even says that they were sorrowful, but it was just like, but were you though? Like, it didn't, it didn't stop you from still eating. Like, you know, you think about when you, if you're fasting, like there's this point of you're trying to get closer to God and, and you're going to, you, you might have these, these down moments where it's not even just hunger, but everything else. I feel like whenever I fast is when everything almost goes out of whack. So it makes the fast even more heightened. So for them, for, so for him to give them such a profound statement, and then for them to be like sorrowful, but it was just like, are you though? I don't really, I don't really know about that. Um, and even says it's better for you to not have been born. Like he makes it very clear. This is a, a important moment, but we're just going to keep eating. And so he took the bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had give, given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine. until that day when I drink um, in the new kingdom. And so um, something, uh, one of the questions was, and it doesn't have to be like a, a, a Webster definition, but um, here we are in the Lord's Supper. And when we think about um, the Lord's Supper, having communion or even baptism, um, there's terminology that's thrown around of a sacrament and ordinances. And so um, have you all heard of both of those terms? And if so, like, do you see them as synonyms? Are they different? Like, what do you think of when you hear the word sacrament or if you hear the word ordinance? And is there a difference? I always kind of lump together with like procedures, I guess. 
Mm -hmm. can, they could. That's the whole sort of like what you're supposed to do, you know. Just um, you know, that's kind of same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sacrament's more like of a ceremony. Yeah. So that's the difference I would say between the two because ordinances you don't celebrate. Okay. So if you look at like the roots of the word, like sacrament is more of something that is a, like between us, like a on earth. Like sacrament, like the blood, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then ordinance seems to be more like ordained, like it's more spiritual, mm -hmm. necessarily ritual. Okay. Like kind of like Jesus saying, like it's not yeah. like you celebrate, it's just you know, it's like, it's not something, yeah, you're just kind of doing it, it you is. know, it's like a <laughs> tradition or something it, like it that. Is, yeah. Yeah, when I think of like ordinance, I think of like if you hear a city ordinance, right? Like right. it's it's like a policy almost. And so, um, so when, when I think of like a sacrament and I'll kind of share, like there's different views, particularly when it comes to the Lord's Supper. Um, so there's a view of called um, transubstantiation where um, people would believe that the bread and the wine actually have a transformation process that represents like it's his physical body, his physical blood. Then there's a consubstantiation uh, viewpoint where it's kind of like a, a sponge, where a sponge is this object, there's water in it, they're still separate, but they're together at the same time. So consubstantiation is this like, it's still, it's bread and wine, but it's like, there's still this spiritual component of the body and the blood. And then you have something where it's more of an ordinance approach of like, no, it's bread and blood. And I mean, it's bread and wine. And that's just what it is. Like it's, there's nothing more to it. And then the last view is, um, it's bread and wine, but there is this, this, there's a spiritual thing that's happening in experience. It's almost like, you know, when you repent or when you pray, like there's an event that's actually happening, um, even if there's not an actual transformation process mm -hmm. of the elements. And so um, in, in, in a sense, in a sense to me, like a sacrament is that, like there's this, there's this spiritual experience component. And I see the Lord's Supper and like baptism as that, like when you, uh, when you're baptized, Romans 6, uh, the first 13 verses really walks through that where you are dead to sin, like brought back to life. There's an actual cleansing that's happening on um, for you. And so not that baptism saves you, but it's this like, um, I, I listened to this book and the, and the guy said that uh, the Lord's Supper and baptism are probably the two closest ways to get, to get close to God in terms of in a, uh, engaging with creation so like like water and and actually eating something but there's this actual spiritual experience that you're happening that's happening through creation and so it's like it, it's a heightened experience that's what like a sacrament would be versus an ordinance like I said it's just more of like a tradition kind of a thing so um you know a, a good Friday service to me would probably more of like an ordinance versus having like like a, like a sacrament you probably would do a sacrament at a Good Friday service, but it's not necessarily a sacrament in a sense that there's this um, this spiritual element. It's just more so a, a it's a celebration of Good Friday of what's to come and, and everything of that nature. So um, like, I got a like Chris is Catholic and I've got a Catholic church with them, and that their like communion is like a sacrament for them since I haven't done the whole process of being like what they call it confirmed mm -hmm, in the Catholic mm -hmm. church like I never do that in mm -hmm. their church because I haven't transformed in that way mm -hmm, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to like accept all of the views of the Catholic right, church right. so I'm not going to take their communion because it's more than just mm -hmm, doing mm -hmm. bread and wine even though yeah. I understand what it is I'm not part of that sacrament <laughs> right 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 <laughs> And I think even for us, like when I think of a lot of times you'll hear a church verbally say, at least say a more of a Protestant church will say, um, if you haven't been baptized, please refrain right. from from partaking in the Lord's Supper. Um, not all of them will say that verbally like that, but they will use language of like, um, you know, repent or ask for forgiveness, kind of like just basically pray to God asking for, you know, forgiveness and, and where you're having this like, okay, you must be a believer if you're doing that process, because if you're not willing to pray and ask for forgiveness and repent, then you must not be a believer. So it, it's kind of like, it's, it's more of an indirect way of saying, hey, don't take this because you haven't been baptized. Right. Um, and honestly, I, I think that in terms of 
taking the Lord's Supper, if you've been baptized, is more of just an order of events that's kind of happened over time. Like here, people were baptized and then they they were part of the church. Like, you know, we think of in this sense, like repent and be baptized, like baptism was this salvific effort that was happening. So after that, then now they are a part of the church body. So they would partake in the Lord's Supper. Um, and so so I, that, that's kind of like more of the history behind, I think, the order of those things. Um, but at least for us, as far as for Harvest Ministries, we would see the Lord's Supper and baptism as the sacrament, like the two things that are like, this is like, there's a spiritual element here that is, um, you're really connecting with God, just like prayer. And it's not just a, a policy or a procedure that we're just kind of going through the motions um, on a weekly basis. So um, we definitely will take that, you know, we definitely take that very serious. Um, but, um, but yeah, so he's just giving just the example of, you know, the bread is his body, um, the blood of the covenant. We see this knowing that when he dies, like this atonement of sin, this washing over, um, cleansed with the blood. So he's letting them know, like, which will, it'll pour out for many, like, hey, here they are in a small group, but this is going to be for, I'm, I'm dying for all, like, I'm, I'm doing this for, for, for more than just this group that's in front of me. Um, but he needs them to know that. So when now, now when he ascends and they go out into the world, like this is the same message. They've been still learning from Jesus at this time. So what is the message that they are going to do? And he says, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink in the new kingdom. So now we're talking about heaven, like we're all going to be there and be able to partake and to celebrate together. So he's saying, hey, just know like this isn't the last time, like it's the last time you're going to do it with me here on earth, but this isn't the last time that you're going to do this together. Um, when it's all said and done. Um, so so that's where he's kind of just going with through as far as the Lord's Supper. Um, I, I like how we even see that um, when he, he took the bread, he blessed it. Um, when he had the cup, he gave thanks. So I think about when we give like grace for our food and stuff like that, like we're just making sure that we're appreciative of the things that we have and how much physical food is a reminder of provision and supplement for us. And so we can give God thanks for those things. Um, anything so far before I finish these last few verses on day one, um, as far as the Lord's Supper, and maybe even just your experiences with that, you know, what have, what have been your experiences, or what do you think about the Lord's Supper and, and, and baptism um, from your background, or just anything? Well, like, I guess that's the Catholic and his parents wanted us to have the kids baptized before they could speak, and like, that wasn't something that I necessarily, I mean, like, you can, but I don't really feel like it's as impactful until they know mm -hmm. what it is, like, what they're doing. And they make that choice to be like take that mm -hmm, step. Mm -hmm. And that was something that we had to fight about a lot. And like Macy wants to get baptized now. And I'm like, see, now she knows what it is. Like she wants to, it's going to be so much more for her. Yeah. Than if we just like sprinkle some water on her head and she's baby. Like that's great. Like having mm -hmm, that ceremony mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And like like bring being proud of like showing up to their baby in church and all that stuff. Like I love it. But mm -hmm. As far as like her, like I want her to make that choice. Yeah. yeah. And his parents don't see that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I do feel like it's important. I mean, and obviously she, she could do both, but I wanted that first experience to be her choice and her. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 the approach that we have. I mean, here at Harvest Ministries, we're very much believers baptism. I mean, I got saved when I was 23, baptized at 24. So like it was very much a decision. I remember my brother was baptized, I think when he was younger. Um, I don't know what that meant to him at the time, um, but I know that he was. And so I think for me, I knew that this was very much a decision. And so when I think about even our kids, especially Elena, because she's a little older, um, I mean, I definitely believe that she's saved. But as far as for baptism, she's still not ready because it's like, it's a lot of people, you know, is my hair gonna get wet? Like it's all these different things. And like she understands, but I think every every now and then I you know I'll talk to her about it again, and she's she's I think she's more comfortable now. Like I think that as we are not in such like a large church setting anymore, like now we're starting a new church, we're still small, like in this room. I think she's more open to like okay, I think I could do it because I've seen these people, I've been around them for some time, and I think that I'm ready. But it's very much like we've had conversations about it. Talk to her. Do you understand? Um, really what's happening here and the significance of it. It's not just an act that you're going through. Like this is a life-changing event. And so um, so that's what we're definitely going to practice. I mean, I, we will definitely do like baby dedications and such, you know, things like that. But believer's baptism is wholeheartedly what we believe. Like you, you will be able to, now I'm not saying you can't be seven years old yeah. and that happened, but, you know, I think at one and two, that's a little bit difficult 
to a hundred percent be like, I know you're saved. Like, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I know that without that level of maturity, it just gets harder and harder. Like I said, I mean, I'm, I, I didn't get, I didn't get saved. I was in my twenties. So just, I, if somebody would have told me when I was 14, what that is, I'm just like, no, I don't, I don't know what any of that means. So I think having people walk you through, especially like if it's young children with your parents is, is significant. Um, and so uh, finishing out just this day, it says, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to Mount Olives and Jesus said to them, you will fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, um, if I must die with you, I would not deny you. Uh, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Um, so we see here, they they sung a hymn after. So, hey, they had praise and worship. They took a little supper, they had praise and worship. You know, we're going to get our sing on. Most likely it was one of the psalms. Not sure which one, but I'm sure they did. And um, and then he, he talks about, um, you will all fall away for this written. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you. And so fall away. He immediately points out Peter. Peter's like, come on, man, I'm Peter. You know, I got your back, Jesus. I'm doing everything you're doing. And he's like, actually not. Um, you're going to deny me three times, not even just once. You're going to do it three times. Um, and so we're going to see that in, uh, in uh, I think, in the coming days here. So um, is there any any last things maybe from day one um, uh, that you guys have have seen or kind of want to talk about? I think the Lord's Supper is really the, the big component there and just kind of understanding because that's it's a sacrament something that we are that we practice um that you know we do regularly what that frequency looks like of course changes from church to church but it still is a regular thing um to do just even jesus level of, of love um steadfastness with them that he's he knows that they're all going to fall away and that one of them is going to completely you know turn against them and then even peter is going to nine three times but he still sticks with them he mm -hmm. goes through this whole ceremony with them and he's not i mean like if i know something's coming up or if it's dental appointment or whatever it is that i'm dreading i just want to like get it over with so i don't mm -hmm. have to think about it I don't, I don't have to worry about it but he is taking his time he's, he's going through the process savoring that moment with them mm -hmm. continuing to teach them and love them even though he knows what's coming and um i just it's it's amazing that he could do that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, like just thinking about like when you've heard someone heard someone said something about you and you don't want to be with that person anymore. Like, <laughs> like that's how petty we are. It's like, well, she said that she said that she heard you say that you don't like my dress or whatever. <laughs> and we don't even want to be around that person. Mm -hmm, but he mm -hmm. knows that, that that person's going to be responsible for him being tortured. Yeah. And he's still like, I have a session. He, he still had dinner with him, yeah. you know, like, hey, you here, you know, come to the table. So, um, uh, so on day two, this is verses 32 to uh, 42, um, it says they went to a place called Gethsemane. And um, so basically, this is a time now, this entire passage is about Jesus going up to pray. And he tells his disciples, hey, stay right here, I'm going to go pray, and I'll be back. And there are these, these three times where Jesus, he comes back and he's like, y'all sleep. Like, what do you, what's going on? I, I told you to watch, like stand guard. We talked about that last week, like be on your guard, like stand guard. And, and with this, um, uh, where it says, uh, verse 38, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, there's this, there's surely this inner desire, this, you know, they probably had an inner change as they've been walking with Jesus spiritually. I mean, I can, you know, I can imagine all the things that they've given up and followed him. Um, but the flesh is weak. And so uh, the flesh, just in terms of like even just worldly things, right? Um, how do you fall subject to, you know, you might be looking at something and next thing you know, an hour has gone by and it's just like, what, wait, what am I doing? Like you just, like the flesh is weak, like whatever you're even looking at. And so he's just saying like the flesh is weak. In this scenario, he's kind of using them falling asleep as the analogy of like your flesh is weak. Like you're supposed to follow me. You're supposed to have this spiritual awakening that's going on yet your body is tired and you want to go to sleep to the point where you can't even help it like I told you to stay up and you can't even help it um and I don't even know what it's looked like I mean maybe it's just because it's just getting late and that's just it but I don't even know what what does it look like up until this point for Passover where you know they uh they had to get to the to the upper room and there was a sacrifice all these different things happening you know how much 
how much different activities and, and work were they doing at this time that might have led to a physical exhaustion or even is it just a matter of it's just the time of the day it's time to go to sleep either way um they couldn't stay awake um but this is a big moment for jesus because uh you know he's saying he, he says it's him peter james and john he said then my soul is very sorrowful even to death remain here and watch and further he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And we talked before about how the cup can represent this, this wrath, like it's God's judgment. And so uh, Jesus is like, Father, like remove this cup from me. I can imagine uh, a child or a student in a school telling the teacher, like if a teacher says, hey, you're going to detention or you're going to get ISS. And I can see them pleading like, no, like, don't don't send me there. Don't what do I got to do to make it up? Like, don't send me there or don't call my parents. I know I know I was acting out in class, but like, don't call my mom, like do anything but call her. And so it's it's just this like he's like, remove this cup from me, um, yet not what I will, but what you will. And so um, the father sends the son, like he's doing the will of the father. And so he's like, hey, I know as a human being, this isn't what I want. Like what human just wants to die? Like, he's like, I don't want to do this. But in a sense, like, but this is a part of your will, especially for the salvation of the, like, I mean, it's what you want. It's just what I got to do. Um, and so, so it's just a significant moment that he, we see Jesus here praying um, to the father. And this Abba father is this like, like, sir, it's this, this, this recognition of like, you know, it's not like, hey, dad, no, it's just like, hey, like, you are, you've poured into me all these years, like, you are my father, you are the one that has shown me how to ride a bike, and you are the one that, you know, uh, taught me about this, and how to, how to you know, fix a car, or something like, 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 this type of close relationship um, is kind of what he's, he's giving to them here, um, and so, like I said, they, they fall asleep over and over again, he just lets them know, like, okay, the time is now. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Um, see, my betrayer is at hand. So when we finished week 13, we knew that Judas was going to be the betrayer. And even back in Mark chapter 3, it labels when they list out the different disciples, it labels how Judas is going to be the one who betrays Jesus. And so now we finally see that come to pass here. Um, did any of you uh, read, uh, it had me this question, read Romans 7, 18 by chance? Romans 7, 18 says, it says, uh, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. So going back to the disciples of this, um, this desire, this inward want to, I want to do the right thing, but the ability in our limited capacity, because our flesh is weak, we fall short. And so, um, so this Romans 7, 18 is just kind of like Paul saying, hey, like, this is almost like a reference, a cross-reference. Hey, I know Jesus isn't here anymore, but let me kind of give you back to a time when Jesus was talking about how the flesh is weak, like the ability to do these things is, it's going to be difficult. As much as you want to do the right thing, I mean, I think about even, I always use kids because I got kids. So I just, that's always my analogy, but how much they probably want to do the right thing. And then somehow it's just, it never comes out the way that they probably wanted to do it. And there's usually repercussions that come with that. But, um, but yeah, so, so just that ability. And um, that's something that I've just really been, uh, I won't say dealing with, but really just mulling over the past few months of just my ability as a human being and my capacity of what I'm able to, what I'm just able to do, you know, I'm not God. There's only so much that I can do, even when I'm trying to multitask. I mean, if you guys see my computer, I always have 20 tabs open and stuff like that. And, it, and it's, it's always like, why do you have so many tabs open on your screen? Um, and it's just like, but honestly, my capacity can't handle that. I'm doing it, but my capacity cannot. Yeah, my desire is to do everything on every tab simultaneously, but my capacity, my ability does not allow me to do it. So that's probably the best example that I have right now <laughs> about, about this verse. Um, uh, so I know we kind of just went through, but is there, uh, what do you guys think about just this, this moment here of Jesus saying, remove this cup from me yet, not what I will, but what you will. 
when I was reading, it what kind of caught my attention or made me think about was just the human aspect of him mm -hmm. and just um, him kind of, you know, like you were saying earlier, like, you know, please don't, like, you know, like, although he knows what's to come, he's feeling nervousness about it or whatever, um, just the human aspect of him, like, it, it, I guess for me, it allows me to give myself more grace mm -hmm. because, like, you try to, like, like you said, try to be Christ like as much as we can, um, but we can't. Mm -hmm. right. So we can just do the best we can. And sometimes I like, if I do something like I know I'm not supposed to, I come down on myself a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but Jesus felt, feels some of the same feelings that I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, this makes me like yeah. yeah, I think all the times that we see his humanity is what that's what draws it in. And I think that's why um, our testimonies are so important because it's the humanity that comes out of our personal story. If I just read the scripture to you, if I read you know Romans roll with all the verses that are the gospel, like does that mean anything without me? but this is what happened to me. And there's so much into that, that transparency, that openness of like, I'm, I'm broken. I mean, I know this is probably like, um, this is, this is not exact theology, but essentially when I read on day one, when it said, when he took the bread after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it. Like my mind went to how many times does God want to bless me, but I feel so broken that I want to just give it to somebody else like bless somebody else because I'm, I'm not even worthy of that. And I know that's not what that's saying here, but just seeing those in that order, like how many times does that happen? Do we feel like we're just not worthy, but yet, but Jesus, he did this for us so that we shouldn't have to feel that. Um, yes, we are going to go through suffering. Like that's just going to be a part of life. Jesus suffered. So if we're to model Christ, we're going to suffer. But to know that that is just temporary that it's not going to be forever, I think is what gives us that hope to go on and to know that, you know, he's, he's walking right by us. Like he's with us throughout the entire process. So um, I think having that, that's just great transparency and just um, openness to know, like, I'm not going to always get it right. And I got grace. I'm not going to abuse that grace, but I know that I do have grace. I need to give myself grace. We, we might always talk about giving other people grace, but how many times do we really give ourselves grace in a situation, no matter what that was. My wife and I were talking about that last night. I think I was just kind of having a day and I was just like, I'm just exhausted right now. I feel like I've done like a lot of things today. Things didn't work out the way. And I was just like, but just looking back, like I need to give myself grace right now because it could be worse than this. Yeah. Like, like it could be a lot worse than this. So, um, so yeah. And so just having those moments and I'm, you know, just having that realization, it, it doesn't always happen right away either. It's not always when in the moment that it happens, it could be a week later where it's just like, man, like I was not so hard on myself last week. Like, I didn't need to do that. And it might've been somebody said something at that time or an event happened that brung it back up. And we're just like, okay, maybe I need to just kind of relax a little bit. Uh, all right, so we'll go to day three. Um, so then 14 verses 43 to 52. Um, and immediately while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the 12, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and the elders. Here we see this, 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 I want to call this the Trinity, but it's like this treacherous three that just keeps showing up over and over again to take him down. Um, now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him and they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant and the high priest and cut off his ear. That's pretty drastic right there. And when Jesus said to him, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled and they all left him and fled. Um, who do you, first of all, who do y'all think cut this man's ear off? It says one of those who stood by drew the sword, but who do y'all think cut this off? <laughs> Peter, doing, Peter doing his thing. I'm not going to deny you, Jesus. He said, look, Jesus, I'm going to cut this ear off. I'm, gonna, I'm not denying you. I'm cutting ears off for you. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so this was Peter. He did that. Now, in I think it's Matthew or Luke, um, 
it talks about when uh, Jesus was like, man, what are you doing? Like, yeah. chill out, bro. You're doing way too much. And then he even says, like, Jesus picked up the ear and put it back on his head. Like, <laughs> he's just like, let's get this back to where it's supposed to be. But he's just like, man, you got to calm down. And I think it's like, I don't think Jesus is saying like, okay, like you cannot protect yourself and, and you know, have arms and stuff. But I think he's just like, bro, let's not be crazy about it. Like, let's not just go overboard chopping people's ears. Because one, on one side, I'm thinking like, is Peter a marksman to chop this man's ear off? Like, that's a, you know, like people are like, I'm going to shoot you in the foot as a warning. Like, yeah. is that one of those moves? <laughs> but at the same time, he's a fisherman. So I'm like, did he just have bad aim? And was he trying to just take him out altogether? And it just didn't happen. But either way, Peter's a wild boy, to say the least. Um, man got a wife at home. He out here cutting off ears. Like, bro, you could be going to jail out here for that. Um, so yeah, so so Judas portrays Jesus though. Um, the one I will kid, so he kind of gives him, we talked about before this, uh, what's the sign that Jesus said with the man with the water, that, that the man was that was carrying the water. Here's this like, hey, the man that I will kiss. So it's almost like a play on what happened before. Here's the the um, the old, the covert operation that you need to look out for, um, where I'm not going to say anything, but just watch what I do, and then now you're going to kind of come in, and so um so so that's what's happening in the scene. So now they they've seized him. This is the arrest is happening. Um, Jesus is in in cuffs at this point, and uh, but he just like you know he's like why y'all coming after me? Like I'm who I was I was in the temple with y'all every every day I was teaching, and he's like day after day I'm with you teaching. You didn't do anything to me. But the scriptures, to, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. This is the same as him saying, your will. Like, Father, if this is your will. And this is really a good scene of seeing God's sovereignty for the plan that he had, but also um, humanity's free will within God's sovereignty. Man is going to do, humans are going to do what they want to do, but God still has a will overall that he's going to achieve no matter what. And he gives us free will in order to still be a part of what he wants to achieve overall. So here he's like, hey, the son has to die. Like that's going to happen. But I'm but uh humans, his his friends essentially are people that he's surrounded with are going to be the ones that take him down. It's not like you know, lightning's gonna strike and he's gonna die. Like, no, it's gonna be humans that are gonna do this to him. And so this is where we see that 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 mix of the two, this God sovereignty of what is his overall plan, but also humanity coming into play where they're like, we do what we want to do. But overall, God's like, gotcha, because this is what I planned for all along. You thought you was doing some, some big things, but you're not. This is what needs to happen. Um, you're still going to pay for it, but this is what needs to happen. Um, and so it says, when it says, and they all left him and fled. So now we're talking about his disciples. So Jesus gets hemmed up. He's arrested. And all his boys with him is like, oh, I can't get arrested, man. I already, they, you know, they might be like, I already got one charge, sir. I can't get a second <laughs> one out here. I cannot do that. So uh, so they all left him and fled, but then it ends with, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Now, scholars say that this is Mark, that this is the only time that Mark, the author, shows up in his gospel, um, because essentially Mark was Peter's right-hand man, so everything Mark is writing is essentially coming from Peter which is probably why he left Peter's name out on the one who cut the ear, because Peter was like, man, don't, don't, this is, don't put my business out there like that. Yeah. But I was always thinking, like, well, why would somebody assume that? Why would somebody think that this is Mark, the one that's running away naked? And the only thing I can possibly think of why that might be is just because if all the disciples had left and fled, we know that the disciples are witnesses. And so um, if Mark is essentially writing the account of one of the witnesses from Peter, well, if all the witnesses are gone, the disciples will hear, he's, does that mean he's still present? So he saw something even though that they left. To me, that's the only justification as to how that if this is supposed to be Mark in here, that, that he was just still there. Even though everybody else fled, he was still kind of lingering around. Um, well, you know, you see it says a young man followed him with nothing. So it's just, Maybe that's him. We don't know, but that's what people think. They think that this is Mark's signature line of like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm in this. You know, Mark shows up in, in Acts, um, but as far as in his own gospel, it's not like we see him say like, like in, in Luke when he's writing in Acts. Luke uses a lot of this language of we, where he's talking about him and Paul and Barnabas and like what we're doing. But Mark never says I in terms of like himself. 
So we never really know what is his role in all this. He's just kind of like an apprentice. So if Peter is a disciple to Jesus, almost like Marcus is a disciple to Peter, he's just kind of just walking along, learn alongside him um, in the process. Uh, but yeah, so uh, so we have the these three groups show up again. Um, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. They're going to continue to um, uh, to rear themselves in this in this situation. But uh, I mean, what do you guys just think about now as we are coming to this point of? I'm just trying to think of today. If we're in a setting and it's Jesus and we're followers, and then he gets arrested, like what do I what do I think at this time? Because I've seen all of these other things happen where I feel like they probably could have arrested him before, but nothing ever happened. Jesus said, y'all never sees me before. And now it's happening. And so I'm just very curious as to what was the thought of them at this time? Like, okay, this is happening now. This, he's going to be mocked. He's going to be, uh, he's going to be seized. Like it's, it's happening now. All of those things he talked about in chapter eight and chapter nine and chapter 10, it's finally here when they're just like, okay, I believe it now. Like it's the process has started. Um, I mean, how, how, what would you guys, I mean, I know this is hypothetical, but what would you think in that situation of, man, Jesus is right here and somebody just arrested him? Like, would I flee? would I say something would I run away naked like what would I be doing in this kind of in this situation that's not usually my first response what could be standard confused like not understanding what I'm like wait what because you expect him no he can't get arrested like mm -hmm. that's that's not how the story's supposed to end. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. They don't seem to pay attention to what's going on. How it's going to end. Yeah, yeah. It just seems like you just expect like, oh no, it'll be, it'll be a miracle. It'll be like when you know Abraham sacrificed the son, and they stop at the last minute. It's like, oh no, that's it's going to end. So mm -hmm. We'll get to this point, and then it'll be like lightning will come by, wipe them all out, and we'll be going on our way. <laughs> yeah. It'd be hard to say like now because in our current time, like everything is like fixable. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. like. We probably, I mean, people I know could probably be like planning, like, okay, like, how do we reverse this? Like, there's got to be a way out of this. Because like, mm -hmm. <laughs> it always works out in the end. Like, we're so conditioned uh -huh. to think, like, no, like, the good guy, he's going to win. Like, <laughs> there's got to be a way. We all come together. Even though, mm -hmm. as he said over and over again, like, this is God's yeah. will. Like, this is what's going to happen. It's the easiest thing for us to do would be to mm -hmm. be like, oh, we can fix it. Like, we can yeah. stop it. So we probably, I mean, my group of friends are probably trying to plan like, okay, like how we bail them out? Like, is, is there some money we can get together? Can mm -hmm, we get to mm -hmm. somebody? Like, it, this, this can't actually be happening. Yeah, yeah. Even though there, there's no faith in it. So it is what it is. <laughs> and they're they going to have to accept it. Accept it. Yeah. Well, Peter and Lisa, I'm like, getting did not it. <laughs> you you the ride or die, Peter? Yeah. Oh yeah. This ought to be one of those, another you know, Facebook thing, but it'd be like tag like the first five people. Mm -hmm. and, like, oh, oh, yeah. Like who's cutting off the ear? <laughs> <laughs> we should set that up. It's not, it's not your choice. It's whatever your ad is. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> That'd be funny. Yeah. Uh, Mom, you got something? I see you got yeah, and the only thing I just want to add real quick is that when you think about it in the moment, of course, our fleshly response is always look all that's right. all on you i'm good i'm still well, standing we're going to day four um <laughs> this is i think the end of chapter 14 um it's quite a few quite a few verses on this so like i said 14 it goes up to seven, 72 verses so this one's pretty extensive but hence i think something to to note here is um you know we as we're going through as we've gone through the gospel of mark we know that there are different uh, events that have happened and when we think about this point in the gospel of mark of 
um, Jesus being handed over, like it's it's numerous chapters of these events leading up to this, like this Passover time is like three, four chapters. Like it's so much meaning here. And so um, clearly Mark is trying to get everything down as he can, but um, they led Jesus to the high priests. All the chief priests, elders and scribes came together. Um, so now they're trying to like uh, come against him. And so basically this, this first section of verses 53 to 63, um, it talks about how people giving these, these testimonies, but they're false testimonies. Um, nobody's agreeing on anything. And so um, in, uh, in Deuteronomy, um, it talks about how uh, if you don't have two or three witnesses, then like basically whatever's being said is not true. So it's like, if I say something against you, Brendan, and we're the only, it's he say, she say kind of a deal. So it's just like, well, I guess we can't do anything about it. So you got to have two or three witnesses in order to corroborate the story. And so in this, I thought it was, it was, it was interesting in that here you have all of these people trying to come around. It's got the chief priests, the scribes, the high priests, um, the elders, the whole council is here. The Sanhedrin is there and giving their testimony, but did not agree. And so if you just need two witnesses in order for something to take place, and it says none of them, their story was the same. Like it didn't, it's like you get all these people and no, you don't even get two people saying the same thing. It's like when you watch First 48, and they got the people in the room and it's just like, come on, man, you know, they ain't got nothing on you. Like, did you not talk to your people before you came in here and get your story straight? Like, what are you doing? They were like, so we found the pin on the floor and they'd be like, oh, he did it. He did it. And it's like, it's like, what are you, what are you doing? You know, they have nothing on you. <laughs> and that's what's happening. Nobody, they didn't get their story together. This entire time, they've been talking about conspiring and planning and plotting, yet they don't have the right story when it counts. Uh, but it finally comes to a point where it says, yet even about their testimony, not agree. And the high priest stood up. He said this to Jesus. Have you not answered? Uh, have you not an answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? And he stayed silent with no answer. And again, the high priest said, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? Um, and Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, what further witness do we need? So now it's one of those that first 48. We don't need witnesses because you just told on yourself. You just said, hey, I'm the guy. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. So he's like, hey, we don't need anything else here. Now, the issue with this situation is going to go into uh, the next uh, the next passage or, or day five, I believe, is they have to take Jesus to Pilate. So they're essentially under this, this Roman control. So they don't technically have the authority to crucify him. Only the Roman government does. So they're just like, they've been building up this case so then they can take it to the Roman government and say, hey, this is what we got against this guy. We need you to go ahead and do what you guys do. Um, so that's really what all this time is about. But just the fact that like they could not agree is just wild to me because there's been so much time they've been trying to get to this very point and they couldn't do it. But the first time it says, but he remained silent and had no answer. Um, but why do you think Jesus didn't say anything? When he said, when, when the high priest said, have you no answer to make? What is it these men testify against you? This is after all of the false testimony. Like, why do you think Jesus was just silent and didn't say anything? I think he knew that um, he knew the outcome or at least expected the outcome. He had faith within himself and it didn't matter what they did to him. He still felt that he was going to come out on top because he knew for sure what he did and did not do. That's what I thought. But, but he did. I thought it was like, right well, they they don't get it together. So why do I need to say anything at all? Right. Yeah. If anything, they've spoken for me. They don't have the story together. So I don't even say nothing. Exactly. Like he was just like, I'm going to chill. But after a while, the will has to be done. <laughs> yeah. The will has to be done. So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That, and so like that goes into the next part, right, where we get to the, the part of where Peter denies Jesus and, you know, the rooster crows and all of that. And the thing is, is that it's not that Peter, it's not that he denied Jesus necessarily in terms of like the deity and stuff. He was just like, Don't, I'm not associated with him more so like, like, that's just Johnny from down the street. Like, I know he's my neighbor, but I don't know him like that. We, ain't, you know, we had dinner together or nothing like that. We haven't done those type of things. Like, that's kind of what this denial, this process that Peter was doing. 
Um, but but he's saying, I neither know him nor understand what you mean. So he's just, like, I feel like this is one of those like, like, come on, Peter, what are you saying? You're almost like giving too much information. Yes. He's like, I don't know him nor understand what you mean. What do you mean you don't understand what you mean? Like, they just asked you, you is this your yeah. friend? Like, you're, you're talking too much. <laughs> so, so you're almost like telling on yourself because you're just saying too much. Like, I don't know him and just leave it at that. I don't, what do you mean though? Are you saying, do, do I, did I know him for this week or was it last week? Have I, Have I, I yeah, are we cousins? How are you asking that we know each other? And that's what, that's where I feel like where he's going with this. Um, and then it says, uh, uh, but again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystander said to Peter, certainly you are one of them. You are a Galilean. Um, but he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. So he said, look, I got to bring out the, the cuss word now because y'all getting on my nerves. And it's just like, he, he, there, his insight, this fire inside of him. And he's probably like, look, y'all see what I did to old buddy ear. Okay, what you think I'm going to do to you? Like, leave me alone. That's what he's saying. Um, but immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus um, had said to him before it crowed. And then, so he broke down and wept. And so that's that That's that humility right there. That's so the realization of, yep, I fell short. And I said I wasn't, and I did it actually three times. So I said I wouldn't deny you, but I actually did it three times. And so I fell short. And it's, like, it's not like these events are that far from each other. This is the same day. It's like let, let at least a month go by, Peter, so you can sleep on it. Like you, like you, you still, it's the same day out here. What are you doing? Um, so yeah, so he just it's it's just uh Peter's Peter's a character. Um, if I highly encourage you all to uh when this is done, our gospel of Mark, to go back and and watch our videos on first and second Peter. When my wife and I did that, because we get into all about, especially the first one is about just Peter's background and stuff like that. And it's just like Peter's just that guy. Like, he's that guy. And we all got some Peter in us in some capacity. We all have Peter in us where, you know, if so-and-so say something to me today, they're going to they're gonna hear it. They're going to get this. Like, this is what it is. So we all have a little bit of Peter um, in us. Um, let's see. So, yeah. So um, something that's significant, which I don't know in Mark it talks about, but when it says um, in verse... 66, and as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came um, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you are the, uh, you are also with the Nazarene Jesus. So this warming himself, um, there's like a fire essentially in, in Matthew and Luke, it talks about there's an actual fire in this setting. But when Jesus actually comes back in, in uh, he's, he's like on the beach area and Peter and them see him in the water, it talks about when Peter jumps out and he swims all the way back to shore, there's actually a fire there where Jesus like cooks fish and some food and stuff like that for them. But there's this redemptive moment where here Peter is at this fire and he um, he denies Jesus three times. But then they get back to this fire part where Jesus has risen from the dead. And now it's this moment of like, I'm calling you to a higher, a higher, uh, a higher duty, if you will. Because Peter goes, he refers to, to John, the one that Jesus loved. He was like, well, what about him? And Jesus was like, bro, it ain't got nothing to do with you. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, it ain't got nothing to do with him. I'm not worried about what I got planned for him. I'm talking about what I got planned for you. But it is a moment of this redemption of like, hey, remember the last time at the fire, you denied me. Now at this time in the fire, when you see me resurrect, I'm going to give something to you before I leave out of here. Like there's going to be a big moment for you. So um, that fire is just like a, it's, it's a, it's a good picture of, um, of, of like a, a redemptive story for Peter um, in this particular situation. <clears throat> Uh, for day five, um, uh, this is verse chapter 15. Um, and so uh, so verses one through 15, um, as soon as it was morning, so now we get into the next day, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. So once again, everybody and their mama is here now, ready to kind of do what they got to do to go after Jesus. I um, mean, they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. So this is when I was talking about oh, under this Roman government, like Pilate is the Roman governor. And so he said, how are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, uh, you have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? So kind of the same thing. See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Once again, he's finally actually in the court. So when Jesus was being approached by all of these religious elite before, that actually like wasn't even like the real court. They were just like, we're just going to pull you in this house real quick. And we're just going to chastise you right now because that's just what we want to do. 
but now they've actually brought him into an actual court of law and the judge is just like what's going on I, why y'all bring this guy to me what is he doing that's even that wrong and so um for him to even say are you the king of the jews like for him like that don't mean anything like i'm not a jew so it doesn't matter to me if you are or you're not but apparently to the jewish people it seems to be a big issue and that's why we're here today um now at the feast, uh, used to release for them one. Now at the feast, he used to release for them. So this is Pilate who would pardon a prisoner at this time. Among the rebels in the prison who uh, who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. So here, was, essentially, we have a murderer, um, and and the uh, and the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. So they're saying, "Hey, we need a pardon. You have all these guys essentially on death row, a serving time, whatever the case may be." Um, um, we need you to pardon somebody. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Um, for he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. So he was just like, that's not really a good enough reason for you to want to deliver him over. But y'all brought him here, so here we are. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. So now everybody's in the crowd like, uh, give us Barabbas. Like they like, take Jesus. Take, like they just like probably chanting out there like, just take him, just get rid of him. Um, and Pilate began uh, to said to them, then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? Crucify him. Like they're out here, like it's a party for them now. It done went from Passover having a meal to now they at the after party. They like, look, we about to crucify this guy, take him away. And so Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd, he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Um, the biggest thing for me in this, uh, this passage is, is the name Barabbas. So we talked about um, when Jesus said, Abba, Father, and Abba, it just means Father. And we've talked before about how when you see like Barjona, it means son of, um, um, uh, like Simon Barjona is Peter's the son of Jonas or whoever. So this Barabbas, it just means son, Bar and Abba. It's son of the Father. Like that's what his name means. So here in this sense, we actually have the son of the Father but the people ask for a man named the son of the father and they choose him instead. So instead of taking the actual son of the heavenly father, they just choose an earthly son of a father here. And I think that that's just, it's just, this is what I love about scriptures because it's just, it's in the details at times. Like you part of this man who's done all of these bad things, he's a murderer, yet you have this man who's healed people He's cast out demons. He's done all these good things, all these signs and wonders. And they're essentially kind of like the same person, if you will, when we're taking the name. And you want the bad person in this situation. You want the person that is, that is the, the murderer, the rebel that's in prison. Like, give us that person. And so I can, man, I'm sure this dude was so happy. He was like, yeah, take, take Jesus. Take that guy over there. Uh, you know, I'm just a regular guy out here. Yeah, I'm a son of a father. I'm just, that's it. I'm not the son. I'm just a son. So just let me go and be a son again. Uh, but I think that, that was just that's just very, very important to to see um, how that plays out. Like, give us the son of the father. It's like we're actually doing what we're supposed to do. Give us the son of the father. But we're going to crucify the actual son, the king of the Jews. And so um, this is setting up now for uh, for week 15, where we get into the actual um, crucifixion. And um, basically, when Jesus comes back and then he gives his his great commission at the end of the Gospel of Mark. Um uh, anything from from this this day in particular, or 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 just from this week in fourteen in general, as we're diving deeper and more and more into just the crucifixion that um, you know you guys kind of want to discuss, or um, just something that's even happened in your lives, maybe in the past week since we've been together, um, and as you're reading these scriptures, that's kind of really speaking to you more and more. I know Trey, you shared about kind of like that that grace, right? Like how I'm kind of getting closer. Are there any of those kind of moments that are kind of happening to you? I know we're talking about a crucifixion, so. I'm, you know, I'm hoping you're not being crucified at your jobs or anything like that, but are, are there moments where maybe you do feel crucified, you know, in a, in a figurative sense, maybe, and it's just like, people are handing me over, people are denying me. Um, I'd love to hear any kind of stories that you guys might have of that if you're, if you're open to sharing. Okay. Sounds like for me, I'm like, just realizing how fickle I am, or just being reminded of it, you know, and thinking, maybe when I was younger, you know, thinking I was a certain way and very steadfast and even keeled. And then as I'm getting older, just realizing in different situations, I'm not the person I want to be or the person I thought I was going to be, you know, and just realizing 
those realistic failures, you know, where Peter thought he was somebody when he got into the situation, he wasn't that person, mm -hmm. he was somebody else, you know, and then just those realizations of, man, you know, how human we are. And it's like, okay, so God, how do you make me steadfast and to be consistently the person that you want me to be? You know? That's good. It's a hard road. Yeah, it's like we 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 will quote scripture and God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But how do we pray about God? How do you make me the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? And not in a sense like I can just be stagnant, but just like that I can be consistent with you. I mean, how many times do we just will fall short? I think about even now and just transparent, you know, I was telling Antoinette yesterday, you know, I'm I'm in seminary now. So I've been reading through Acts and now we're getting into some more of Paul's epistles. So I've been going through Galatians, reading through the gospel of Mark, but I was just like, I haven't, I'm not reading something that's like just for me. Like I'm reading scripture, but like what's something just for me? Like that's a moment to me where, and as, you know, lead pastor of the church, like that's a very convicting moment because it's not that God can't, is not still talking to me through these things, but it's just like, like when I was, when I read through Ezra, like a month ago, it was just like, like, wow, like he was just showing up and showing out. Um, I know at the dream team meeting I shared from first John, like I, even though I got it that morning, it was, I still felt like it was for me, even though I felt like it was to share with you all. And so um, I think that that's just one of those things where um, that grace, right? Like still got to give myself grace in those moments, but I can almost crucify myself in a sense where, oh, am I held to this standard or should I be doing this? You know, as a pastor, how many times are people going to come up to me and say, you get a word for me today? You know, this is like, I don't have a word for you today, sir. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have that for you today. <laughs> uh, but I think that there's just that having that, um, uh, just that grace in those times, you know, I think for me, that's just kind of, I think that what I've been uh, kind of just going through personally so um so yeah but thank you for sharing that Heather. yeah but Kara was saying about like being christ-like and how so many people feel like that means that you're perfect and it's not like obviously in many times like we'll come to see like he didn't want to physically experience it like mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. something that like and as a human man you just like trying to get out of it like I, I don't want this I don't want to feel this this is painful this is hard and like you're talking with people like out you know, about like our beliefs and whatever and a lot of times in my life like when I've been trying to talk to people about being Christian I'm like oh so you think you're perfect no mm -hmm. like, yeah <laughs> not I at all that's that. not the point like, <laughs> the whole point is is that none of us are and it's the striving to be consistent like mm -hmm. you said not perfect mm -hmm. But the constant striving, like mm -hmm. we do fail, going back to scripture, going back to prayer, going back to your group mm -hmm. and find, find ways that you can be better the next time. Yeah. So. I mean, it's like when they, you know, uh, the word says that Jesus is the second Adam, right? So essentially Adam was created perfect mm -hmm. and then sin came into the world. And so nobody's perfect and then until Jesus comes back again. And so the story of, our faith, I mean, even going back into Jewish days solely, but it's this, it's God makes something good or God makes something out of nothing. Even you think about our beginning of creation, God makes something out of nothing, out of chaos. He turns it into something good. Man comes in and messes it up. God gives judgment. He fixes it. And then it happens all over again. And the Bible is the same cycle over and over and over again. And so my wife and I were talking years ago and the question came up, why do you believe in Jesus? And I was just like, you know, I'm Sunday school answer. And she was like, no, like, like Jesus, like as a man, why do you believe in Jesus as a man? And we just sat there and it was just like, because man always falls short. So God said, I need to come down in the flesh as a man to show you what it's like to not fall short. Mm -hmm. Like to show you what, not that you can be perfection, but to show you what perfection looks like and what you will have in being perfect when eternity comes. And so to say like, why do you believe in Jesus? It's not just like, he's my Lord. It's like, why do I believe in Jesus? Like, why did God come down? Because God was like, I've given you chance after chance. We talked about the vineyard owner where he sent the tenants he, and then he sent all his all his people, his prophets to come through giving these warning and nobody listened to them. Nobody listened to them. And God said, okay, I'm done. If I'm upstairs and my kids are down here and they do, or let's say they're upstairs and I'm down here and they do something, don't make me come up there. Like, that's what I'm going to say. Don't make me come up there. Because if I come up there, it's going to be a whole different situation. And that's what God said. God was just like, I'm going to come down here. 
because I'm sick of looking at what's happening. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to show you how it's done, but I'm going to do it with grace. I'm going to do it with love and compassion. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, uh, just hit you over the head with insults and do all these different things, but I need to show you how it's done and what it looks like. And so I think that that's just a game changing component when we think of Jesus, not just as God, but also as man, because what did as a man did he do? Yes, he got hungry and yes, he did this, but he did this too. He, he, he had to show us how to walk. And now we have his word in order to say, okay, this is what Jesus does. So whenever I have a situation, what is the situation? What does the word say? Now, what do I do? What is the situation? What does the word say? Now, what do I do? And it's, we're following, and everything in the Bible is going to point to Jesus. So it's not like I can't go to the Old Testament because it's just going to point to him too. Um, so we need to have that in the coming. So I just kind of want to just, uh, I, I just want to just share that um, <clears throat> as we're kind of closing out today. Uh, I'm going to pray us out. Um, are there any prayer requests that I can just kind of pray for while we're together today? Anybody online as well? You can say it or put it in the chat for me. Can you clear up the stomach bug? Oh, at least we're saying some kids left today from school. Yeah, it's a mess. It didn't seem like a mass exodus like the last one or two. Because last week, we, last week we were somewhere, and I think you might have messaged her. Me and Antoinette was gone. She was like, "We get, we picking them, we picking them up right now." It takes out seven teachers. Oh, that's bad. Yeah. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Okay. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, thank you for uh, just another time to come together again to um, just to give you praise, to um, to show you how much we love you by studying your word, to see really what is it you want us to know about you. And we know there are things that we fully can't grasp, but we know there are many things that we can. Um, and then the things that are not mysteries, we're grateful as we continue to dive deeper and to learn from them. Um, we pray that we can continue every day to strive to be more and more like you, Jesus. We know that perfection is not obtainable, but we know we can strive to be better each and every day. Um, but in that striving to give ourselves grace at the same time, um, we know that you are going to love us. Um, you have unconditional love for us. There's nothing that we can do or say that will make you love us any more than you already have. And we're grateful for that unconditional love that you give to us. And we pray that through that unconditional love um, that we're able to then have bold faith, knowing that we are loved um, as adopted children in your family. Um, to now share um, this love that has been given to us to others. Um, so just grateful for that. Um, praying for um, just this, this stomach bug, this sickness that's been going around at schools. Um, we know when, when, when there's kids and germs, things can get pretty, pretty wild. And so we're just praying that, um, that that can just be suppressed, um, that those are not feeling well will um, have the means to, uh, to maybe get some medical treatment or if they're able to stay home um, just to get better until they're well. Um, we just pray that that can just subside um, wherever it's even coming from, that those things can be um, just eradicated from, um, um, from, from our area and, and from all, all other areas that are experiencing this same thing. Um, so we're just praying for the health of, of these young kids, praying for the health of the teachers and the faculty at our schools as well. Um, they're right in the line of fire, just like our children are. And so we're just praying um, for them as they continue to lead. <clears throat> Um, especially considering um, the amount of time that our kids are around um, their teachers and, and other administrators. Um, it's almost like another family member. And so we're grateful for the things um, that they do and for the love that they pour out, but just praying that everyone can, can be healthy um, physically, um, but also healthy mentally and spiritually. And so thank you for this time together. Um, I'm praying for anyone that, for Jesus, that just truly just does not have a relationship with you, that today can be that day. Um, and for those of us um, that do have a relationship with you, that um, we can stand tall, stand firm, um, not cut off ears like Peter, um, but we can have uh, a grace, um, but also give truth um, in our conversation. So thank you for this time, uh, praying for safe travels for everyone. And thank you for the technology for allowing those to join us online. And we're always grateful for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was